Hello, and welcome to episode 26 of the Power Score LSAT podcast. This is John Denning in Los Angeles. And this is Dave Kalorn in Napa Valley. How you doing up there, buddy? I'm doing outstanding. Outstanding? Yes. It's quite a way to start. It's been um, a good day overall. There you go. Uh, I'm having a good day too, but you tell me about yours. Well, first off, my day has been excellent because I'm drinking a melon ball. <sighs> you know, I'm going to put you right on the spot because <laughs> this is a cocktail that baffles me. First off, listen to it. No, I hear nice. you. Nice. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was never a doubt, but tell me how you make a melon ball. And for well, those curious listeners out there. It turns out that I'm, I actually must like colored drinks, like colored cocktails. Mm -hmm. So like blue, green, red, you name it. If it's got color to it, I'm probably interested in drinking it. <laughs> Usually because that means it's got a lot of sugar in it. I was thinking if it glows under a black light, but go ahead. If, if you... <laughs> if you go to a, a liquor store, you will see that bottle of green liquor, and it's it's Midori. And that's the primary ingredient in a melon ball. And usually you add something like vodka to it and then some amount of orange juice. For me, not a tremendous amount because I like to keep the greenness. There you, go. you get this light green color to it that I think is aesthetically pleasing, and the taste is – I like Midori. So. Well, the greenest drink I've ever had with you, I think, is uh, absinthe. In a yes. subterranean bar, which is what it was in that Amsterdam, cool. yeah, if you recall, that was probably you may not recall. Actually, I do recall that quite well, as a matter of fact, because they put the uh, sugar over it. Yeah, they light a flame. Yeah, exactly. Oof. That was a, that was a night, and uh, that was real absinthe before it started becoming more legal in places like France. That's right. Yeah, that was the wormwood absinthe. That, exactly. That I don't know if I saw the Green Fairy that night, but that's also because I think I passed out at some point. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I got run over by a car. <laughs> I... <laughs> was that, did that end at 6 a.m. in that uh, bar yeah, in Amsterdam? Yes, was did. that that night? Yes, it did. For Fantastic. me, it did. I don't know where you were. but I was there, too. I saw a sunrise. <laughs> it may not have been a sunrise. Uh, uh, it was yeah. a sunrise. I remember it was really cold. <laughs> yeah. yeah we, had, anyway. we had a great time. There are some pictures that will never, ever be shared. I yes. am drinking to get us back on topic, sort of. Uh, just a tequila soda. I'm being boring. You're pretty straight uh, with that. Thank you. You like the tequila, though. I do like tequila. I wish it liked me back. I think the problem is is that in almost all these cases, you drink something that I would absolutely cringe at drinking and be like, uh, and this, the reverse <laughs> is true as well. Yeah, pretty You're much. You're like, what are you drinking? That's why I like to visit you is because I can always raid your liquor cabinet and never feel <laughs> like a pang of guilt. No, I have plenty of things like tequila and whiskey and bourbon that I'm like, never going to drink it. Go right ahead. Everything I steal from you, I feel fine about. <laughs> I did pick the song for today, though. And yes, this, did. this I'm really happy about because it's an old classic. This used to get me pumped up for like soccer games in high school. Uh, it's the Beastie Boys. It's sabotage. And how does that fit into the thematic unity of the day? Well, as we circle back to Flaw in the Reasoning, questions uh, and argumentative errors and things, I mean, it's kind of perfect, right? Like, it's the idea that the test makers are presenting you with arguments that an author thinks are fine, but that are, in fact, self-sabotaging. Sabotage is right on the money for that. There you go. So, yeah, support that choice. Thank you. Uh, it's just a great song, period. Objectively song. great song. I'll fight anyone who disagrees. Uh, <laughs> before we get into the LSAT flaws. What's up in the LSAT world? Only really two things, and they're both, I think, fairly minor. Although the LSAT's coming up in two weeks, so that's more major, but there's no there's no pressing aspect to it, sure. so that's why I say it's minor. And the other thing is that the October registration deadline, it actually ends today on the day of our recording, so by the time this comes out, the deadline will have passed. So after this, November will be the test that is available. And as I've said previously, I strongly recommend signing up now, uh, not just for November, but for January, if that's the test you're looking at, because we're hearing reports of test center problems uh, and wait lists. They have opened up some new centers. They've opened up new seats, so that's good, but better safe than sorry when it comes to this. Yeah, it's a regrettably good point, which is these places are really filling up quick. 
So if, if you're looking to get signed up for November, hustle. Even January into later tests into next year, into 2020, they're starting yeah. to fill up. Hopefully they'll op- they'll keep on opening spaces up, but I just don't have any trust with something like that. So if you're thinking about it, lock it in, and then you won't have to worry about the problems that a lot of people have gone through quite recently with wait lists and not being sure if they had a seat. Mm-hmm. And now LSAC is guaranteed that they will have seats, but not necessarily in your hometown. You might be sent <laughs> quite a ways away, which I think is patently uncool. Uh, yeah, unless you're in the mood for a vacation. <laughs> That's not how most people think no, about taking meals. I know. I'm trying to put a ray of light to this, a silver lining. <laughs> it's a weird um, try. This may be, Dave, our fastest ever move into the actual topic of the day. I regret that because usually I like a, a good bit of banter. <laughs> well, there's more things to talk about. New iPhones got announced today. I'm super excited. <laughs> That's my Christmas. You know this. Yeah, but it's not that great of an iPhone. Yeah, it's really not. I I wish I had more to say, frankly. Yeah, if it would do (sighs) thinking for people or myself, that would be fantastic. But really, it's just a better camera. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. And as a guy who detests selfies, I don't have a whole lot. You are a huge Apple fan, so I know that it was slightly demoralizing that they didn't come out with some kind of new insane feature. That's a strong word for it. I don't know if I was demoralized. I just could have hoped for better. You're demoralized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's right. move on. All right. Where's the Let's flaw? Get... In, where's the flaw in Dave's reasoning? There is none. There is none. Okay. But let's talk about some flaws in LSAT reasoning, which I find far more interesting. <laughs> and if you haven't already, go back from two episodes ago and listen to part one of this, where we talked not just about flaw in the reasoning questions as an opener, but then we talked about some of the most frequently appearing flaws on this test for both the reasoning being used in the stimulus and for answer choices, whether correct or incorrect, things like circular reasoning, for example. Yeah, to me, that conversation was really important because it introduced the idea of why it is so necessary, frankly, to understand uh, not just what the common flaws are, but how this benefits you, not even in this question type, but elsewhere. You see this in Weaken, you see it in Parallel, you see this other places, too. If you know these flaws, even as wrong answers, you are immediately ahead of the curve. And you also see it in real life so much. Well, you know, this that, is, yeah. This is like the one of the more direct ways that the LSAT interacts with the real world, where you're like, okay, I saw this LSAT argument, I now understand this flaw, and it's kind of like mistaken reversals and mistaken negations. Once that occurs and you realize what they are, you begin realizing that you're hearing it on the news, yeah. your friends are making those mistakes, and you can either, either laugh about it or be frustrated. I tend Correct. to laugh about it because I'm like, mm-mm. But the same thing happens here. The very first flaw that we're going to talk about, which is one that's known as the straw man, mm-hmm is one that you see in politics all the time. I say this to people all the time. Like It actually makes you a better voter to know these things. It makes you a better citizen. And maybe that's a little bit high-minded, but the truth of the matter is, it does. The more you know about what someone else is saying and whether or not it's using valid reasoning, the better off that you'll be. Agreed. So it's not going to hurt you. Let's put it that way. There you go. So what is a straw man, John? Uh, This is one of my favorite flaws of all time. Uh, one of, yeah, um, this is the error that occurs when someone takes your position and repurposes it, essentially, quotes it typically, um, but misdescribes it in a way that makes it easier to attack. Yeah, they change what you've said, and they literally put words in your mouth. That's right. You even see or that phrase page. a lot of times, where they say, like, so what's your what you're saying is, or what you really mean is, or what my opponent would have you believe is. Yeah. And, I mean, again, if you can't see the immediate uh, real-life analog to that, you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> Frankly, I mean, that's just... I'll, I'll leave that for okay. what it is. Uh, no, I, I didn't I agree assign a name. Or I didn't... No, no, you don't have to. I didn't even put a political party on it. I'm just saying this happens constantly. Well, I think, you know, for me, the key word is, and I use this in the Logical Reasoning Bible, is they refashion the argument. That's a good way to put it. They take the words 
that were used by the first speaker, and they come back and they say, well, what you're really talking about or what your real position is, and then they distort what was said and either expand it or change it in some way to take it to a position that is not something that the first author actually had said or was a position that they were committed to. So, so I, I hope I'm not jumping the gun here. I might be. Um, let's talk about the title of this flaw, Straw Man. Because I have heard two competing arguments for where this title comes from. Ooh, let's hear the competing arguments. All right. Here's number one. Straw Man, number one, is uh, that you essentially um, construct something that is flimsy, that is made of it's paper mache, basically. It's a very easy thing to take down, despite the fact that the original argument wasn't so vulnerable. That's number one. Okay. Number I subscribe to that theory so far. Right. Number two, and this is my actual favorite, is almost like a scarecrow argument, where a straw man becomes something that you repurpose, reconstruct into a scarier version of its component parts. Which I, I again, I like this a lot. I mean, what is Clever. what is a scarecrow? It's just straw and an old flannel shirt and maybe a flimsy hat, but it looks menacing to crows. Yeah, well, <laughs> to lesser <laughs> to lesser minds. But again, it's the kind of thing that is intimidating. It's frightening when it shouldn't be. If you knew what it was made of, it wouldn't be frightening, and yet. It appears to be. I always like that. That, you know, that they, straw man version of benign components made menacing. Well, it makes it more inflammatory, yeah, which then causes a, a greater it. reaction, which is easier to argue against. Sure. I think what you're really getting at is, is that it doesn't have to be uh, mutually exclusive with these two. They could actually both be true. Yeah, yeah, I think they can. As opposed to a false dilemma, which is something we'll see soon enough. Yeah, we'll talk about yeah. that eventually. You like that yeah, it's not one product. or the other here. Right. I think you have elements of both. The idea of the straw man is it is easier to knock down. Either and way, so, yeah, either way you frame it, wherever you want to title this, the nomenclature, regardless. I think it's uh yeah, I mean it's it's scarier than it should be because someone has reinterpreted for you. Yeah, well, even if you take the second route, you end up back at the first route because much, that yeah. gives you the opportunity to knock that argument down more easily. Yeah. So, but that's an interesting point because what it means is is that you are changing what the original speaker said. And that means that you have to have two positions here. You have to have an original statement that was made in some fashion. And then the person creating the flaw has to come back and say, well, this is what I think you said. And then they make those changes. And then usually what they do is they refute that new position that's right. that they have presented. Yeah, They're like, okay. that's exactly it. It's, yeah. it's a strange case because the flaw doesn't exist in the argument itself. It exists in the repurposing of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, in the change <laughs> of what is actually being made. Right. I was just following along with what you were saying. Yeah, yeah I, see, I, could, I could almost hear your mind turning. Well, when you said in the original argument, I was like, in the original argument of the first speaker or the refashioned? So, yeah, I precisely, to make sure. yeah. The original argument of the first speaker isn't necessarily bad. It's what someone does to it. It also isn't necessarily good. That's right. We're not actually making a value judgment here on what the very first speaker said. It's just that the second speaker took that, and in changing that position, that's where the mistake comes in. Mm -hmm. But, of course, they've done that for their own purpose, which is to then knock it down. And I'll give you an example of it. Do it. All right. Let's say we have two speakers. First speaker says, our town requires infrastructure improvements. Uh, in particular, we need road repairs. So we need to devote more of our yearly budget to issues like this. All right. Second speaker could come back and say something along the lines of, all right, I, I'm surprised to hear that, um, that you feel our town shouldn't spend money on, or more money on improving schools. Why are you so anti-education? <laughs> and of course, that's not what actually happened. Right. The first person was saying, we need to spend more on things like roads and bridges and so forth. 
And so we need to increase the amount of money that's given. There's been no comment about education or even reducing education or alternatively not increasing the education budget. But notice how the second speaker came in and said, oh, I'm surprised. And I didn't say what you're really thinking or what you're implying, but you could easily throw those words in there and it would fit perfectly. Uh, all of a sudden, it turns into something about schools. Why aren't you focused on schools? And that becomes, why are you so anti-education? Yeah. And you can see it's like they use a slippery slope where they just go down and all of a sudden, we started talking about road repairs and we ended up with, why are you so anti-education? Yeah. That's a beautiful it, example. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the speakers in there would be like, yeah, why are you so anti-education? Because in many cases, the <laughs> straw man argument builds that scary position. I can't believe that person's anti-education. And in politics, this is highly effective because a lot of times that forces the first speaker to come back and say, hey, I'm not anti-education. Right, right. Which, you know, sounds like you're guilty. Yeah, it forces a defense of something that you were never guilty of in the first place. Yeah, you can't just ignore. You have to be like, no, 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 I'm not anti-education. I was focused on road repairs, but now the focus of the argument's been shifted. And there's certain I know, dude, I'm figures. in my head, there's a dozen examples <laughs> that I'm hundreds. like biting my tongue over. Nah, let it go. I know, I, I mean, am. There's, I am. My figure example just, holds. So I'm going to leave yeah, it at that. Yeah, politics is rife with these examples, <laughs> and this is more or less drawn straight from politics these days. <laughs> But this has always been a feature of argumentation. You you could go back 50 years and see this, or 100 years, and people were doing this to each other. Can I just so. say, and I, I don't typically self-congratulate, but in this case it's mutual, good for us. We've, we've held back from some <laughs> political talking points that are easy to... I'm just going to... I always say this, I want to avoid politics. There's certain topics that I really just don't like to talk about, <laughs> politics and religion being the two at the top of the list. Oh, man. But do There's I? There's a lot of different opinions. Do I have what? thoughts? You have many thoughts on this. I have reconciled myself to not <laughs> worrying about it. You're thoughtless. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually more thoughtful than uh, yeah, you are. Right. You're thoughtless. That might be it. Anyway, that's a great example. I think it serves the point. Um, but straw man arguments... Do these come up with any kind of frequency that you would tell people to expect to see one? In the in the arguments themselves, yeah, yeah, as not an very flaw. frequent. As an actual flaw, it's not the most frequent flaw. There are a few famous examples. There one, there's the one about the dean of students yeah. talking to the student representative. I'm glad you bring that up because that to me actually represents uh, a, an underlying position that you see sometimes in these, which is this um, almost stratification of positions of power or positions of authority. You see straw man arguments often made by people in uh, authoritative dominance, if that makes sense. Um, the dean of students question is a dean of students talking to a student body representative. Uh -huh. And he commits the straw man argument, the dean does. Uh, you see this often, where someone has a clear position of authoritative power. And well, they're more likely to be believed. It's more... right. At least in our society, it, the authority kind of like implies persuasion. Well, they must know better. So it's why it's an effective tool for a lot of speakers yeah. making making these types of flawed arguments. What I tell the students all the time is you really be mindful of the fact that the test makers, to their credit, if I can give them this, uh, are cognizant of that. They tend not to give immediate authority or immediate like credibility to people who would tend to have authoritative presence or authoritative authoritative credibility like advertisement probably a flaw executive probably a flaw politician corporate flaw. spokesperson yeah you get it <laughs> flaw 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 uh these are positions where they they tend to impose some degree of like immediate vulnerability in terms of argumentative credibility. True, although in a flaw like this, this actually is, is more of a seductive technique because mm. the typical reader might even subconsciously think, well, Dean of Students is, is likely to know more about policies. They might, without realizing it, give that person more credit than they should, which makes it harder to spot the straw man that's actually occurring. Yeah, that question for anyone out there wondering... Uh, I just, I have to elaborate, I'm sorry if this reveals Do too it. much, but it's just a great question. 
uh, the student representative is saying, essentially, like, you shouldn't have expelled this person um, for speaking ill, and again, I'm paraphrasing, uh, of another student because he was just expressing his right to free speech. And the dean of students says, what you're doing is endorsing harassment. And you can't do that. Like We can't have our students harassing their pupils. Now, of course, that's not at all what the student did, but that's what the dean mischaracterized, and that's really what this flaw is, a mischaracterization. The, no one's going to be on board with harassment. Right. So all of a sudden, that that new argument looks like, it, well, it's much easier to, to then beat down the student representative, and it has that scarier aspect, like, oh, no, we can't do that. Yeah. So it really t- it satisfies both the elements that we were talking about. It before. is, and again, I don't want to go down a political road, but it's a trumped up version. I can almost feel you smirk. Well, yeah, because it might be a little late. For <laughs> Sorry. Talk about your political roads. <laughs> anyway, when you get into the anyway. answer choices, you, this occasionally is going to be the right answer in, in the in the Dean of Students question that we're talking about, and, and we'll actually link where that question is, or at least the, the prep test that it comes from sure. in the podcast notes. It's it, it will be a right answer on occasion. It's usually more often a wrong answer, though. And you see LSAC describing this in a couple of different ways. For example, one that they've used is refutes a distorted version of an opposing position. Mm-hmm. And you see that distortion element there. You didn't just use what they said, you changed it. Or misdescribing the opposing position, thus making it easier to challenge. There's that misdescription sure. you know, going right along with distortion. You, what you won't see, though, is an answer choice that says straw man. <laughs> if so only. you don't have to. Yeah, if only. We <laughs> use that name because it makes it really easy to picture what's happening and to remember what this flaw is, not because that's the language that LSAC uses. Right. So when you're looking at that, the thing you have to realize is, well, what is an actual straw man from an abstract logical standpoint? And it really is, it's uh, attacking a distorted position. Yeah, it's a really good point. So yeah, so, two things to me, if, if I had to break this down. First is, you often see people, what you're saying is, or if I understand you correctly, or what my opponent would have you believe, you almost see this preface of a restatement. And then the answer choices you just described have yeah, that. Once, that's exactly right. And once you know it's a straw man, if you go look at that dean of students question, it just drives the point home so clearly. It's one of those moments where the illumination should be 100%. And you walk away after that and you're like, I know what this flaw is. I'll never miss it again. Yeah. I'll be able to recognize it when it's present. And if I see it in a wrong answer choice, I'll be able to eliminate that decisively. Yeah. And that's exactly what we want from these discussions about various flaws is for everyone to say, all right, I know what that is now. There's perfect clarity. Yeah. Well, perfectly clear to me. You want to move on? You bet I do. I bet you do. All right. (laughs) Uh, Let's talk about a broader category that has some underlying components to it, which are appeal fallacies. That's right. There's a lot of these. Yeah, there are. Many of which do not appear on the LSAT, but some of which do. And people immediately tune out. <laughs> well, we're not going to talk about the ones right. that aren't right. on the LSAT. Right. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm not an idiot. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, it's just that the LSAT doesn't <laughs> tend to uh, use some of these. But the idea of an appeal fallacy is that you are making an argument where you all of a sudden call upon some element. Yes. And you use that as the justification for your position. And some of the ones that we'll talk about tonight are, say, an appeal to authority, Mm -hmm. appeal to popular opinion, uh, even appeal to emotion. What we won't talk about as much is something like appeal to force. You know, that's what you see when you you run into something like, oh, we have to have a justification for you know, there'll be problems or war or something like that. There's all sorts of appeals that we don't need to worry about. So yes. let's focus on the ones that are most applicable right. to the LSAT. And hopefully that discussion will then prepare anyone else. If if the test decided to add a few, Which uh, they could. then they, they they'd could. understand at least what the general 
idea is that's happening here. So let's start with appeal to authority. Sure. All right. Keeping it relevant. Fine. Um, all right. Appeal to authority. Uh, <laughs> to me, I, I think this could almost be recategorized or, or retitled as appeal to an inappropriate authority. Which, yeah, and you may have a comment, which is mostly to say an appeal to authority is fine if that authority is relevant, if that authority has some bearing on the matter at hand. The problem is, just because you're an authoritative figure on some subject doesn't make you broadly authoritative. Yes, and let's let's step let's take your point and actually walk it out to the broader sure. idea. Sure. An appeal to anything could be relevant as long as it's relevant to the topic. Right. You know, you you talk about an appeal to emotion. If the if the topic <laughs> is emotion, then it's reasonable to appeal to that. Yeah. Or if you're talking about how people feel Why do you feel sad? That could be an actual talking point. Yeah. The problem with all these fallacies is that they use the appeal at the wrong time. So if we're having a discussion about climate change <laughs> and global warming, and we start referring to authorities who actually have studied this and are known experts in it, that's completely appropriate to do. Sure, but my uncle, who is an orthodontist, a well-regarded orthodontist, probably shouldn't speak with authority on the weather. Are you sure, though? I mean, he might. I've, <laughs> he might. <laughs> he might. <laughs> but the, the beauty of this one is, is that, you know, sometimes people are like, well, I have a friend and they know a lot about it. Well, we don't know anything about right. them. Yeah. You, you see this in advertising constantly. Uh, and I, the first example that always comes to mind for me is Michael Jordan and tennis shoes. <laughs> and, and almost anything that celebrities are hawking is usually some kind of an appeal to authority. Uh, and you, there's probably a, an appeal to fame in here as well. Yeah. But what does Michael Jordan really know about tennis shoes? Uh, I, you know, I wonder if this is actually the best example. It, just, just bear, okay. bear around right. with me. I don't want to hear this discussion of you know Zion Williams knows Williamson knows a lot about tennis shoes. I don't know who that is. Destroy them. I don't know who it is. Oh, the he was the guy just, who hurt his ankle because the shoe blew up. Right. You know, he was the number one pick in the NBA draft recently. That's all. We went to Duke. It's all good. Oh, yeah, okay. Whatever. Michael Jordan. Let's go back to him. I know that dude. <laughs> I know Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan can jump high. I'm sure he <laughs> understands, like, this feels good and what have you. But is he really an expert on the construction of tennis shoes and what have you? I don't know. It's more of a fashion-related thing to me and a great logo branding exercise. <laughs> there's, there's one that's been on ESPN uh, frequently, and I'm obviously a sports fan, whereas John clearly is not. Oh, shut up. And uh, don't get upset because I'm speaking truth. <laughs> and you see this commercial right now, and it's Frank Thomas, and these people are like, Frank Thomas, you know, you're in such great shape. He played baseball, and right? Then, yes, he used to hit a baseball. Yeah. A long, long way. Nailed it. <laughs> Name one team he played for. Uh, anyway. The Cubs. Don't. The Cubs. How'd I do? Right city. And so uh, let's White continue Sox. on. But he has in a commercial for Nugenix, which is like some testosterone yeah, supplement or something. Yeah. And it's really interesting because people are like, okay, this is a guy who was a sports star and, you know, was the big hurt, basically, just a huge dude. And so now all of a sudden they're pairing him up with testosterone. But he's not a doctor. He doesn't right. know anything about it. He's just getting paid to push it. And it's a great example of like they're acting as if he might be some type of authority when I don't know that he really is. Gatorade commercials is another one that you see where it's like, yeah. oh, these athletes really know what's going to replenish electrolytes. Do they really? I'm not sure they do. Yeah, that Gatorade thing where it started in Miami, maybe, somewhere down in Florida. It was uh, Gainesville. FSU. Gainesville, yeah. Ah, oh, jeez, man. Come on. Anyway. Uh, FSU is in Tallahassee. I know where FSU is. Florida's in Gainesville. I would like to make sure everybody knows that I know this. <laughs> I would like <laughs> to make sure that everyone knows I don't. <laughs> when I said Gainesville, you were like FSU. Yeah, well, no, and, no, no. I knew Tallahassee. And the entire state of Florida <laughs> cringed at that moment. They were like, ah, jeez. <laughs> uh, they can float away. Uh, so... <laughs> That's not how I feel. I love Florida. I know you do. 
<sighs> raise your standards. So I think uh, when it comes to an LSAT version of this, what tends to occur is you see authorities essentially related to or, or appealed to, as the name, the verb goes, uh, appeal to, but they're really not in the right category or they're really not in the right discipline. That's how I, I tend to expect this flaw to occur. They're close, but maybe not the specialists they need to be. They might be a scientist, but they're, they're not a scientist of the particular topic at hand. Something like that? Um, yeah, I think it usually even goes further afield than that. There's that, that classic question of, like, you know, biologists I've talked to have, have confirmed to me that there's some truth to astrology. That kind of thing. I'm trying not to laugh. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's an absurd conclusion, period. But, but why would you think that biologists were going to be the ones to speak with any kind of authority to um, that? Yeah. On that, right? It's okay. I have I have a good friend who uh, recently said to me, <laughs> "Well, I mean, you know, like they're the planets and stars around us, so they have to be having an impact oh, on geez. us." And of course, you know, Next friend, moon, past friend, from a, no, oh. absolutely not, good friend. Uh, it's literally the moon does have an effect. Uh, I can't actually say that's not true. So it's like, all right, I just left it. I did not want to get into the debate, but I was like, wow, I didn't expect that. Uh, yeah, you know, over Mercury's there. in retrograde. <laughs> I'm gonna jump off the roof. I think that's where we we go to, you know, off the the end of what. Someone I is decide. listening to this right now. I've been like, yeah, oh yeah, uh, of course. But I'm, I said, I said to my buddy I had a dinner the other night and got yelled at. I said, uh, we were talking about star signs, and I said, well, you're a Cancer, but what's your sign? <laughs> I said it to Sean. You know Sean. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> he left about eight minutes later. He actually walked no, out of the No, it wasn't because of that. Sean it can, might have been for something some else. I'm sure I said something else, but that's what it was. <laughs> that's most likely. You did say something yeah. else. Sean is an affable, easygoing guy, so <laughs> I think that he would probably look at you and be like, John. Come on, dude. <laughs> but, you know, I think the the point that you're making is... Yeah, they're they're somewhere in that vicinity. Like you're talking about a scientist, but if you think about it, a biologist is not an astrophysicist. So they're they're under the umbrella, but they're not in the right vicinity of where things need to be. Yeah, I love that you tried to find a, a discipline that would actually speak with some authority on astrology. Uh, <laughs> but I take your point. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was trying to bring it back to the point I was making. I know. So, and, you know, just to continue on with some of those examples, I use a bunch of sports examples, but the doctors and dentists' examples on television are rampant. Four out of five dentists recommend Crest or whatever it is. That's a direct appeal to authority right there. Yeah. And so when you see things like that on the LSAT, it is usually along the lines of all of a sudden they are citing someone who should have some knowledge or could conceivably have some knowledge in this. And if they cite a person who actually, in fact, could be seen or is proven to know what they're talking about, about the exact subject at hand, then it is okay. Yeah. That is not an appeal to authority. That's actually just citing authority. Sure. A physicist talking about relativity is exactly what you would expect. That's exactly right. That is that is completely acceptable. The problem is, is when the actual discussion point at hand is different from their area of expertise or it's not specific enough in terms of what they say yeah. four out of five dentists you know that's a different type of error uh, you know in terms of survey but it also is then used to appeal to this authority so that's the key thing is to make sure that what's being talked about is actually relevant to that person. Sure. If it's not, then you have a potential problem here. Can I introduce one final point to this and then we'll move on, which yes. is the source argument idea. That you see this a lot of times, um, questions the credentials, questions the authority of the person. Um, you, you need to be, you, listener, as a test taker, not you, Dave, need to be mindful of the fact that it's one thing to challenge someone on their uh, authority to speak on something, whether as a source or an appeal to authority thing. Uh, and a 
different thing to talk about whether their argument is good or bad. That's actually a great point because, you know, going back to a source argument, which was what we talked about two episodes ago. That's right. Is any attack on a person automatically a source argument? Precisely. You get it. And it is not. If you're attacking something about their character that's not relevant to the point they're making, that's what a source argument is. But if you're trying to undermine a scientist's statement by referring to uh, her credibility and her knowledge of the topic, that's not a source argument right. because we're now in the right arena. Exactly. Source arguments go outside the argument at hand or the topic at hand and instead deal with something that is really irrelevant. Character or reason. motivation or yeah, yeah. The hypocrisy or something like that. That's right. Yeah, so it is it is possible for you to attack somebody's position or what they know about a topic without it being a source argument. So your point's well taken yeah, because beautiful. there's a few LSAT answers out there where you look at it and they're like, well, isn't this a source argument? It's like, no, they're actually allowed to attack them because they're talking about something they all are aware of. Perfect. And I think you actually did it more justice than I was going to. So thank you. I try. <laughs> you succeed. Uh, let's talk about another appeal. Yeah, before we do that, I do want to mention okay. that typically when you see this described in an LSAT answer, it's going to be something like, it appeals to a source that does not have you know, relevant knowledge to the topic or applicable knowledge. It's going to be some kind of phrasing like that where you're like, wait, do they really know what they're referring to here? And in those cases, they didn't. Then it's, then it's an appeal to Perfect. authority. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now let's move. All on. right, now we can move. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, another appeal, a little less common, but you do see it, which is, and again, you see this a lot just in the, the scope of life, appeal to public opinion, appeal to numbers, most people have believed, that kind of thing. Uh, the test, this is how I, I often phrase it, Dave, to students of mine, the test does not have a very high regard for what the majority of people think. I think that's a good way of putting it. Mm. Just because the majority of people believe something doesn't mean anything. That's right. Is really what it reduces to. Yeah. And the test happens to know that and will sometimes use that. And when we talk about popular opinion, that's usually something where you see this, like most people believe or many people think, where they're trying to say, hey, this is a commonly held position or belief or opinion. The appeal to numbers side of this is usually when people start citing high numbers as a justification. Uh, you know, the example I was thinking about beforehand that I actually wrote down because I liked it so much was <laughs> the Flat Earth Society Facebook page has over 200,000 likes. That's right. So there must be something to it after yeah. all. And th this is actually true. <laughs> well, to you're going to really want to qualify true. <laughs> that it has over 200,000 likes right. is what is that true. That is true. <laughs> not that I think that the earth is flat. <laughs> not that there's not something Kyrie. to it. <laughs> yeah, me and Kyrie Irving disagree <laughs> on this particular point. But, you know, somebody hears that 200,000, that's a lot. Maybe that is, maybe it is real. Yeah. No, it just means that 200,000 people think it's hilarious. So that's what you're getting there. But yeah. that's an appeal to direct numbers, like a very high number. But they could have just as you know, easily have said most or many people, and it would be that same kind of appeal to popular opinion. Yeah, I was uh, screwing around on YouTube yesterday. Yesterday, literally. Uh, and there's a Louis C.K. bit that just happened to pop up in my feed about uh, a conversation he was having with his daughter where they were watching the news one day, something, PBR or something, and it was the 9-11 deniers. Now, I'm not going to get deep into this before you furrow your brow and worry about where I'm going. But mm -hmm. she thought it was nine... I'm already worried by that. Yeah, way. I know. She <laughs> thought it was nine people who deny 11. 9-11 deniers. There were nine of them, and they think it's 10, 12, 13. They deny 11. And he goes into a whole long thing about it. But it's the same... <laughs> it's the same thing. Now, that is not a popular opinion, but I, in my head, I thought about this exact same thing where I was like, yeah, just because there's a, an army of people who might share a, a common belief doesn't give it weight. It doesn't give it credence. Now, there's in this conversation with his daughter only, she's like six. 
There's only nine of them. <laughs> but it was in my head. It, I immediately flashed to this conversation. I was like, yeah, nine. Nine people who deny 11. Well, that's a little bit what Dave Chappelle was saying about the Michael Jackson. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go much further in it, but <laughs> okay. he was saying, I, I don't thought believe I was towing the line. <laughs> no, then here I go, just blasting <laughs> yeah, past there you it. go, <laughs> storming overhead. Chappelle's special, which is, you know, he's hilarious in general. He has some very um, provocative opinions in the newest one, and he actually Sticks says, sounds, I, don't, I don't believe that Michael Jackson committed these crimes. And in a sense, what he is saying, just because everyone else believes it, doesn't mean I'm going to. Right. So I won't further comment upon the and actual... you completely agree with Dave Chappelle. <laughs> I, I can't say that I do, but yeah. he does make an interesting point about like, well, could it, you know, what, what really is the case? These days, all you hear about is fake news and uncertainty. Right. So I'll leave it at that. But that's really what he's saying is just because everybody believes it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to believe it too. And that's kind of what they're doing in these arguments where they're like, well, a lot of people believe this or most people think this. Mm -hmm. That fact, even though it may be entirely true, doesn't actually prove a point. Right. It just means that most people believe that, not that it is suddenly the case. Yeah. We're, Opinion does not become fact Precisely. We're going to talk about survey errors in a second, which often hinge on this exact same idea, which is just because the majority of people think something doesn't make it true. That's right. Yeah. It doesn't take a whole lot of like long view historical perspective to look at human history and see how wrong we've been about so many things. Yeah, the earth is flat after all, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, that big bright thing revolves around us, etc. etc. It doesn't? Well, we should talk after. <laughs> I'll call you up. Anyway, we'll move on. Now that we've talked about Louis C.K. and Dave Chappelle, <laughs> I think we're in sufficient trouble to... Uh, <laughs> Let it go. Thanks for joining me on the dark side. Uh, let's talk about one more appeal. Yes. Appeal to emotion. This is my favorite one. It's my favorite one, too. Uh, mostly because I've found lots of opportunities to use it to my benefit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to ask about what that means. God, my parents are just gullible. So I... <laughs> Everyone's parents are a little bit there. You go. They're always sympathetic to their kids. They hope the best for you, John, and they're continually disappointed. And suspect so the worst. Time, yeah. Yeah. Every time they see signs of hope in you, they think to themselves, <laughs> "Maybe this is the time." You know, then, I I love my parents' judgment, except for two exceptions. One is that the other is they really respect you. Your parents are right on both counts. <laughs> All right. Appeal to emotion. I love your parents, I by know, the way. They're awesome. They love you right back. Um, more so. Mm. This is what happens when, instead of trying to win an argument by facts, by um, basically details, you instead try to influence someone based off of, and again, I hate to use the word, but an emotional plea. Uh, my favorite is like a cop pulls you over because you were speeding and like, please don't give me a ticket. Like my dog died this morning, that kind of thing. That's a good example. Anytime somebody says, think of the children. Yeah, that. It's, a perfect it's usually an appeal to emotion. Right. Think of the children. Think it's like, the children. this does not affect the reasoning. Uh, I think, as I mentioned to you before we started this, any commercial that features the music of Sarah McLachlan. mention this to me. Uh, is usually an appeal to emotion and a strong one too, because then yeah, I'm I'm I love animals, and then they show all these kind of like sad, yeah, abused animals, and dogs then, in cages about to be put. Yeah, and that's a that's a direct appeal to your emotions, and then they put her music over it, and she's wailing, uh, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> but all, you, in key, like oh, you know, she's too, she's a great singer, tunefully but, wailing. They always choose a song where it's like, oh, man, I feel worse for having listened to yeah. it. And the next thing you know, you're like opening up the wallet. But that's a direct appeal to your emotions sure, there. For the price of a cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I put a caveat on this? Which I Certainly. think it needs to essentially umbrella hang over all of the flaws that we talk about. Aside from uh, internal contradiction, which is something we mentioned last time. 
none of these make an argument wrong. It's just that each of these keep an argument from being right. And what I mean by that, I suppose, is that when you hear an appeal to emotion or appeal to popular opinion or any of the survey errors we're about to talk about, any of it, each of these serves to essentially reduce an argument to 99% correct or less. Weakens it. Yeah. And arguments can be true despite having these inherent uh, insufficiencies. These just hamper, they handcuff. And and that's really what you're looking at when you see an LSAT argument. It, a circular reasoning argument, like we talked about in the last episode, two episodes ago. These are things that make an argument less than guaranteed. That's it. Arguments can yeah. be true despite these deficiencies, but these are the things you need to be on the lookout for. They don't destroy the truth of the conclusion. That's they just haven't proved it in a definable, valid manner. Yeah, they they've still they serve, left it open. Precisely. They serve as an opportunity to remove certainty from the argument. That's yeah. it. And, I, you know, I think sometimes people get hung up on weakened questions, for instance, uh, as a close comparison or sibling to this, where they're like, well, I have to destroy this. No, you don't. No, you just have to make it less believable. Each of these serves to make it less believable. You seek to destroy it because <laughs> that puts you in the right mindset to attack it. Sure. But at the same time, in, in say, 15, 20, 25 lines of an LSAT problem, very difficult to utterly and irrevocably destroy an argument or a position. You just don't have enough space to do that. So what ends up happening is, is you seek to destroy it, but usually you end up just hurting it a little bit. Precisely, yeah. There's an ambiguity to it that allows you to have this impact. Um, but are you going to come in like scorched earth? Probably not. So change your expectations. Yeah, just because someone has used one of these flaws to get to their conclusion doesn't mean that their conclusion is automatically and irretrievably false. Right. It just means that they didn't prove it the way they hoped they had proved it. Right. There may be a different way to prove it. Yeah. So usually the LSAT doesn't deal with that in a direct sense unless they're asking you to like strengthen the argument or what have you. Right. And then you can go about looking for those I like things. that irretrievable phrase. Yeah, That's really that nice to say. Uh, yeah. And now that I have Sarah McLachlan on the mind. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're weeping into my headset. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think exactly how to describe some of the songs they choose for those commercials. I don't know. Uh, did you come up with anything? Moaning, gut, wandering. Gut wrenching. <laughs> <laughs> she actually has a great voice, but. Oh, she's I fantastically just, talented. Yeah, I just find that the songs that they've chosen for that are just like, they've chosen well. Yeah. You don't want to watch a minute long commercial like that because it becomes painful and that's the emotions that they're playing on. Yeah, I'd rather hear a cover of Katy Perry. That wouldn't be as effective. <laughs> Probably you know, not. If they played California Girls <laughs> over the firework. I don't <laughs> think people would be opening their wallets quite as uh, no, efficiently. So no, for them, not. it may be an appeal to emotion, but it's probably highly effective. It's extremely effective. A lot of these flaws are. Straw Man is extremely effective. We should oh, yeah. have common sense gun reform. She's coming to take your guns. It's like, that's not to get too political. No, but I mean, that's somebody got elected on a relevant it. example from today's political landscape. I don't sure, see anything wrong sure, with sure. it. So, yeah, I mean, that's the problem with these flaws. They exist because they work. That's exactly right. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's move on to survey errors. Another of my absolute favorites. Well, the history of this is tremendous. You know, survey science has been one of those things where it's taken a while for them to get up to speed to understand some of the mistakes that were being introduced yeah. within the whole process. And I'll, I'll preface this discussion by saying that, in general, the way the LSAT looks at surveys is that if they are conducted properly, they are valid. They don't have a problem in using the results of a, of a survey to make judgments and to think to themselves, all right, this is actually a fair way to analyze a problem and arrive at conclusions. The difficulty 
occurs when something goes wrong in the survey or something was done incorrectly. At that point, it's fair game. And so what that means is that as an LSAT taker, you cannot look at a problem and see the word survey and think, we've got a flaw. Mm -hmm. It's not the mere presence of the idea of a survey or the occurrence of a survey. It's the nature by which the survey was actually executed that becomes the key thing. Is that a fair? Yeah, I think that's very fair. Um, Good, because I'm right. (laughs) You haven't said anything (laughs) controversial, so okay, you're right. Congratulations. I would say that sometimes it's easy to lock in on surveys or problems. Survey errors, there's so many of them. If I see a survey, I'm going to be skeptical. Well, okay, let me actually, let me maybe put your back against the wall on this a little bit. Probably probably not. Uh, But I I will put my fists up. When I see a survey on this test, I expect an issue. In the same way, if I see an argument preface with advertisement, I expect a flaw. And usually there is. And I'm not trying to conflate the two. I I realize they're not the same. They're different. Yeah. If I see, you know, public opinion poll or in a survey or in a study, I expect something to go wrong. They tend to. I would say that there are plenty of instances where surveys are used and they're okay. Yeah, you're looking at exceptions. I would say the majority of the time things go wrong. I would say that (sighs) when, yeah, we're going to have a slight disagreement here. I guess I I will put it in more direct terms. In my opinion, LSAC hates advertisements, advertisers, and marketing people. Sure, like politicians, businessmen, corporate they, spokesmen, all of it. Not, not businessmen as much. Businessmen will sometimes have like valid arguments. But advertisers in particular, politicians as well, often are giving out bad arguments. Whereas the rate is not nearly as high with surveys. All there right. are questions we can go to and be like, there's no, not a problem. Let me there. ask you a question. Or a, okay. No put you feet to the fire. Mm. <laughs> Here it comes. It's not a very hot fire. Uh, do you find that surveys go right as often as they go wrong? Is it 50-50 is what you're saying? Yeah. I'd have to sit down and actually look at no, it. No, just but give it... me your gut. <laughs> you're not going to do it? No, you know what I'm doing right now. I'm running through questions I know, in my I head. Can actually, I can almost <laughs> hear the gears turn. I'm immediate. I'm like, I just, I did that thing with your eyes where you look up and, and to one yeah, side yeah. and you start thinking. I'm doing the recall and I'm running through questions. I'm thinking, okay, that one's flawed. That one's valid. I don't think it's maybe 50-50, but it's far more valid than you see with, say, advertising. I'd go so. 70-30, 80-20. I don't know if it's eighty twenty. Mm. Now I'm gonna have to go look at this afterwards. Oh, no. I've just wasted your afternoon. Thank you. You're welcome, pal. No, but the truth is, is when I look at something that has a survey, I'm aware of the fact that there are a number of instances where it is actually okay. Okay. You know, if they say respondents to a survey said this, and then they go on. It could go in one of two ways. They could talk further about that survey, and I might see that there's an issue, or they could make an entirely different point, and it's actually acceptable. It's kind of like, in a, in a sense, they can do this with causality. Causality in a conclusion is almost always a problem. Causality in a premise is okay. So when I see causal statements, I'm immediately assessing where they're occurring in the argument. That same kind of thing happens with surveys. I'm like, well, how are they using it? What are they doing with it? Mm. My level of like, you are terrible, <laughs> isn't nearly as high as when I read advertisement. Then I'm like, what terrible things about to be said? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense. Uh, I wasn't trying to put a percentage on it. I was trying to give a mindset or an attitude. Sure. About I, how I it just, works. I, two things. One, there are degrees of terribleness. Advertisements tend to be high on the scale. Uh, of potentially terrible. Two, I, I don't want to. I don't want to prejudice anyone to think that surveys aren't going to go wrong, because as we're about to see, and this is my attempt at a segue, because we could dwell on this all day. Uh, there are so many ways for a survey to be bad. Okay, that's fair. Okay. There are, but just because there's so many ways, doesn't necessarily mean that there will. That it will fall victim to one. 
but there are. That's the key thing to me here is to realize that just because you see a survey, don't start thinking that's going to be the answer. That's what I'm trying to avoid. All right. What I would encourage is always be skeptical, always look for a fault. Most of the arguments you see on this test are going to be flawed in some way. That's part of why we're having this discussion in the first place. Agreed. I'm not disagreeing with you on that. However, what I want to avoid this is that. This got a little bit contentious, and I didn't mean for it's, it to. It's not. I actually okay. don't. It's just, I think it's a maybe a, a more subtle, nuanced point that you're having difficulty understanding. So I want to make <laughs> oh, sure that boy. you're clear on oh, it. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anyone listening didn't just take the heat of that, yeah, I sure maybe. did. I mean, if you're you... going to throw it right down the center of the plate, I'm hitting it. Jesus. No, right. I know you understand this. It's, it's a matter of degree. <laughs> If you see a survey, a lot of times people will say to themselves, this is where the flaw is. And then they start putting blinders on and they don't look at the rest of it. Okay. I'm like, you cannot do that with survey questions. That to me is the real takeaway here. Okay. It's not so much like, what's the percentage? That to me is far from the real takeaway. But if that's your point. That's the takeaway of the point I'm attempting to make right now. Okay. All right, good. Let's continue on with what those... <laughs> numerous errors that you refer to actually forward are. progress yeah, uh, but yeah there are a bunch of ways the surveys can go wrong and despite the fact that sometimes they're okay which maybe is where you were going that is exactly what i was saying right. is when done properly lsac has said we believe in surveys and they're okay with us okay. yeah so I'm, that's the key thing done right we're good but they're often done poorly yeah Tip that? typically done poorly is that too strong I don't know. Come on. A lot of times. I said uh, often. Right. Now we're parsing out small differences. Right. Let's move on. Yeah. Uh, what are some ways that surveys can go wrong when they do? The first has to do with the, the group being surveyed, the sample, essentially. And to me, as I see it, this is actually, it, it bifurcates. There's two ways that uh, the sample can be problematic. One is how the survey itself selects the sample. Two is the conclusion that the survey bases uh, the sample upon, if that makes sense. Okay. And, and they're related. There's overlap. These are semi-concentric. Um, but let's talk about both. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about the actual nature of the sample. This is often called a biased sample. That's exactly right. So the... Think about the bias samples that you see. In fact, anybody who has Instagram <laughs> as putting up a bias sample of your life, typically, because you're not selecting the boring moments or, you know, when nothing was going on or the bad meal that you had. Yeah, Instead, that, that it's... Friday night at home where you ate cereal for dinner, <laughs> right? <laughs> and never took off your pajamas. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Long. No, you're like, look at me on vacation, and here I am at this jazzy restaurant, and I'm out with my friends. Yeah. You're actually creating <laughs> a uh, a biased sample by the, the, the pictures that you put on Instagram. And so somebody who would look at that would say, like, wow, this person's life is amazing. And, you know, there's already medical conditions where people are being affected by seeing all the greatness that other people are living. It's Wait, making them depressed. Really? Yeah. Oof. Well, I mean, if you keep watching the Kardashians, you think to yourself after a while, everybody should be rich and stupid <laughs> and be able to do whatever they want. So, although I, uh. that joking aside, <laughs> Kylie Jenner, credit to her, because she's created a makeup. Just don't call empire. her self made, please. I will not call her self made. She you. had a very, very, yeah. very high platform to jump off of. <laughs> yeah. I should say that she wasn't going to fall that far, given everything that her sisters and her mother had done for her. This might be the most honest episode of this podcast we've ever had. <laughs> it's certainly pop culturistic. <laughs> uh, it's centric on that. You so. and I bite. We bite tongues to the point of like self cannibalism. This well, we has been, yeah. Yeah, we it usually we usually stick to the LSAT, right. except for the first like five or ten minutes. This time we're able to actually pull in a lot well, of. Well, that's stuff. what the flaw of fun is, right? It's, it yeah. allows you to kind of like expand into the world around you and see the same issues crop up. You can break lines, sure. 
<laughs> but so, you know, trespass in the Instagram case or Facebook or whatever it is, the things that you choose to put up there, they actually do create a bias sample for other people to look at. Mm-hmm. But you could take this in social media and and kind of extrapolate that idea. Let's say that we wanted to figure out how people around the world were using their time and we decided to go to Twitter. Mm. Is Twitter going to be a good sample of people worldwide? And would it be representative of how those individuals use their time? And the answer is clearly no. Yeah. Because there's a certain type of individual that is on Twitter. It's going to be restricted to people who have fairly consistent uh, access to technology. And that's going to leave out large portions of the world. So already, if we were to say, oh, as it turns out, I used all this information that I gather from Twitter, and it shows that people spend eight hours a day online. You know, it's great for Twitter users, right. but that's not the average person. And that's what a bias sample looks like. You draw this conclusion, often very global in nature. Oh, people spend eight hours a day online. I know that because the people on Twitter do. Right. Well, some people aren't on Twitter. It also could be that the people on Twitter are just more avid than you know people who use other platforms or don't use more platforms More opinionated, you mean? Crazy. <laughs> okay. I spend a fair amount of time on Twitter. You do, actually. Uh, I, I wonder this about you sometimes. Well, I, I stick to the LSAT, man. <laughs> you know? But it is interesting because over time I've met people really from all walks of life. And it is interesting to see the things that they follow and the things that they say. And it is – sometimes it really goes into a rabbit hole. Sure. But yeah, you can, it is not you can spiral in a hurry. Uh, yeah. This is the first of the – types that I was talking about, where the conclusion group isn't necessarily represented by the group you're choosing to observe or, in, uh, back to the title, you're choosing to survey. Uh, in the same way that like you're not going to get an accurate representation of baseball players by looking at the All-Star game. Same thing, right? Like It's just unreasonable. One of my absolute favorite questions, and I'm happy to say that we have it in the course, talks about people wanting to be told if they have a serious medical condition. And one of the weakened ideas in that is that everyone surveyed is a young student in introductory psychology courses. That's a fantastic answer. It's my favorite answer in that question. Why is that a problem for the survey? Is because you can't talk about the world, you know, 70-year-old grandmothers in India, by young students in introductory psychology courses. It's too narrow a sample. It's too biased a sample to represent the conclusion group. That's exactly right. Yeah. And it's interesting because in that question, you're actually saying this is who we chose to look at. Mm -hmm. There's another sampling error that is based upon who decides to respond. That's right. And this is the nature of how the survey essentially selects participants. Um, my favorite example of this of all time, and yours too, I suspect, is the 1936 election. Uh, yeah. Roosevelt, who was it? Was it Roosevelt being an incumbent? Uh, Franklin Roosevelt? It was Alf Landon and, and Roosevelt. Uh, yeah, uh, Alfred Landon being the Republican governor of Kansas, I think. Um, and it was very clear based on this survey that Landon was going to sweep it. He was going to crush it. Well, what had they done, though, in the survey? Right. That was the interesting thing. They'd sent out, and they sent out postcards to, like, all the subscribers of this magazine, and then based upon the people who returned the postcards. Yeah. It was the, the said, Literary Digest, I think. Yes, the, the Literary Digest. And they said, for sure, based upon these results, Landon's going to win in a landslide. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you think back, well, who, who was it that was actually the subscribers? to the magazine, and then the response that those people made. They were overwhelmingly Republican. Mm -hmm. And so here's a magazine asking a bunch of Republicans, who's going to win? And they're like, the Republicans is going to win, and then declaring nationally, Republicans going to win. Yeah, I think it was like a 19% error or something in that. It was huge. Yeah, it was The other thing about that, which it was also they surveyed Hundreds of thousands, I think almost 2 million 2. people. 2.4 million people. Which goes to show that the size of the sample is irrelevant if it is biased. Yeah, you want to know my favorite part of that whole thing? George Gallup, for whom Gallup polls were eventually 
uh, named, surveyed 50,000 people, a fraction, and got it right. Yeah, because mm-hmm. they did it more randomly. Mm-hmm. And there was that other one, it's in the uh, the Logical Reasoning Bible, is the uh, 1948 election with Dewey oh, yeah, that's and right. Truman, mm-hmm. where they called a bunch of people. I hope I'm not mixing these two up, but they called a bunch so. of people. No, no, I think you've got it right so far. And as they called them, they were like, who are you going to vote for? And everybody was like, Dewey. Well, of course, at that time, the people who had phones tended to be Republican. Right. And so once again, they had a biased sample, but they didn't realize it. And so they printed that famous headline <laughs> in the newspaper yeah. that says, Dewey wins. And then they've got a picture of Truman holding it up with a big grin on his face. <laughs> they actually had to print a huge retraction, I think. I wonder why. Yeah, who knew? The example <laughs> I yeah, the example I often use for students in class is like, imagine that I got like a, a white pages out. For those of you who are young, a white pages lists all of the publicly listed landline phone numbers. Yeah, and on like a Tuesday afternoon at two p.m., I started calling these numbers and asked who they were going to vote for in the next election. Am I going to get realistic results? Or a representative, predictive results. No. They're not going to reach me. I don't think they're going to reach you. Uh-uh. They're going to reach my parents. Yeah. Which is... People without, you aren't working, what have yeah, you. Yeah, Tuesday afternoon, landline. You're not going to get a, a vast swath of the voting public, which actually represents a certain type of voter. So this is the way that a survey itself can be constructed um, self-harmfully. Yeah, by who you picked. Right. Another way you could have it is, let's say you're in uh, a mall, if there are many of those left. <laughs> there are. And you want to do a survey on people who are friendly, and you start saying, hey, would you answer this survey? Well, the people who say yes... Right. are self-selecting themselves. And most likely, they're probably going to be friendlier or more outgoing. And so all of a sudden, you're selecting the people who are more likely sure. to fit a certain profile. Yeah. And that's where you get the responder bias, that the people who are actually returning the results to you may themselves be self-selecting based upon Precisely. the type of person they are. Yeah, to call a landline on a Tuesday afternoon, they not only have to have a landline and be home on a Tuesday afternoon, they have to pick up the phone and talk to a stranger. That's right. At each successive step, every Russian nesting doll of selection in this, you whittle down the population who participates. So that's not the only flaw, as John's pointed out. There's so many. The uh, <laughs> Thanks, let's move buddy. to the next one. Yeah, let's talk more. <laughs> I didn't disagree that I, there were many I, flaws. I, I just said you can't assume that it's going uh, to be flawed because it says the word survey. Three points taken. Uh, now you, yeah. you can choose the wrong people. Or they can choose themselves. You can also ask bad questions. The wrong questions, yeah. So that becomes really the, the second flaw here is that the way in which you construct the questions or the nature of how you pose them can by itself completely skew things. Um, and probably my favorite question in that vein is, what's your favorite bar in town to drink at? <laughs> right. You know... The presumption in there is you like to drink at bars. Yeah, you're out and about, right. Yeah, what is your favorite? That you actually have one. And so it already starts at that level as opposed to saying, do you drink at any bar in town? If so... Do you drink? Yeah. Yeah, do you drink? So, and what's the name of the bar? Uh, (laughs) I love that you and I basically just presumed the first. Well, yes, for us. Straight. I I can easily say my favorite bar. (laughs) <laughs> I can tell you my favorite bar in like 20 towns. <laughs> Same. Uh, yeah, it's, to me, I, I tend to think of this more as like the questions can lead you to an answer. The example I, I sometimes give to students is like, um, what's your favorite color? Which color do you prefer, red or blue? But before you answer, keep in mind, people who say red tend to be more successful and they're generally thought to be better looking. Now, if you're like me, and just a contrarian by nature, you're going to say blue. I'm still saying blue. Yeah, me too. But the majority of people out there would be like, I want to be good looking. I'm su- I'm successful, right? Red. I'm a red person. Yeah. That was uh, one of those meet the Fockers, Ben Stiller comedy moments where he's like, oh, they say smart people pick green rental cars. 
He's like, oh, green rental car. And he's like, yeah, but they assigned it to you, whatever. But it's the same th- <laughs> It's the same thing. Like, the questions themselves can't prejudice you towards a response. They have to be neutral. That's the what they're attempting to do. Precisely. Yeah, I'd be like, you know, with the iPhone announcement, if I was like, how much do you like your iPhone? <laughs> I'm already presuming that you like it and am prejudicing you towards saying something that's more positive. Right, oh, I right, like right. it a lot. Yeah. Or or you could say uh, the majority response to the new iPhone has been overwhelmingly positive. What do you think about yeah, it? Yeah, where do you stand? You hear a question like that and you're like, oh, everyone else thought it was good. And we know that humans are influenced by what other people think or do. And so you hear that and you think to yourself, oh, yeah, I liked it a lot too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's where you've constructed a bad question that leads you to a response that doesn't reflect reality. Right. How do you feel about the banks in this country preying on the middle class? It's like, oh. I feel badly about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> I feel great. They wouldn't pray on I feel, them. I mean, I wish they'd do it more. Like that, no, no one says that. So, you, that would be very, very contrary. It would be, and probably what I would say. Uh, so, but the, it's a good example. You don't see this a huge amount in LSAT questions, but when they do do it, it's it usually is pretty clever, and you have to look inside the question itself. So, if they ever say this was the question that was asked. Make sure that it passes like the neutrality mm-hmm. test because that's what it needs to do. Yeah. If it doesn't, you can have that flaw of a survey question being constructed improperly. That's right. So you've got to have the right group. you got to ask questions in the right way. And then I suppose as a third category, people have to be able to give an accurate response. Or desire no desire they to. might be able to they have to desire to do it right. and that's where it gets a little dicier with the uh the nature of the question or what the response actually means mm-hmm. to them or how they perceive themselves yeah so you got to be a little suspicious about people's um just reply and now now sometimes it's obvious like dave if i were to ask you if i were to say like hey buddy which birthday party did you have more fun at your first birthday or your second That's a, I assume, that's a question you couldn't respond honestly to because, well, who could? I don't recall. Exactly. I don't recall my first 30 birthdays. But that's one of those things where you just, you couldn't genuinely tell the truth. But there are certain questions to which people are inclined to lie. And how much money do you have? How much do you weigh? Mm Mm-hmm. People would not want to give a true response yeah. to that. If I walked around, you mentioned a mall before, so I'm stuck on it. Mall? <laughs> yeah. Just my nostalgia kicking in. Uh, if I walked around a mall with a scale, went up to people and was like, hey, how much do you weigh? And they were like, uh, stand on this. I'm not going to get an honest response. I'm going to get a lot of people running. Probably security. Self-selecting themselves out. Right. So the, <laughs> these are the kinds of survey questions themselves that are problematic. Yeah, because people don't want to give real answers. Sure. And that's when you can get these biasing factors. And it's all sorts of things. You talked about weight, sex, money, who you might vote for. All these things play into topics where someone might not wish to publicly reveal their answer yeah. or individually reveal their answer to who they're talking to. Did I talk about sex? No, I just oh, did. Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> but I mean, that's a classic question. Sure. Is, uh, how often are you How's your love sex? life? Yeah. Yeah. And then people are like, well, every day, aren't you? Yeah. I and, <laughs> yeah. All I'm of a sudden you're like, <laughs> you know, Britons are having sex daily. It's like, no, they're not. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they felt like they had to to exaggerate their position or their standing. Is that an actual? Team. Are you quoting something? I don't know that it was Britain, uh, but they there's there's studies from early on when they were asking these questions where they're like, we're not getting real answers. Gotcha. People are lying to us. Why? And then they're like, oh, they're not taking this as confidential that we really don't care. Yeah. It's that they want to look better. I got you. Yeah, I think they cut a hole in a sheet. Is that how the Brits do it? I don't have any idea what you're talking about. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> you're are, you saying, are they so shy and retiring? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. It's 
It's a missionary in the dark with a hole cut in the sheet. That's Not in my experience. No. Oh, my but, God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Huzzah. I think that, that brings us <laughs> pretty much to the end of the, uh, the discussion here of these various survey questions. And you can see the different ways that there are problems. Mm-hmm. Even if you have a reasonable question, you might not get a real answer just because of the nature of who you're asking or whether or not they want to review that. And there's all sorts of problems that come up in, in the selection and construction of the questions. Yeah. So you just have to look at the way it is presented on the test. And that's always the key. Any of these things, you know, whether we talked about source arguments earlier and then we talked about it two episodes ago, it's not so much about attacking a person, it's attacking the right things about their argument versus the wrong things. It's not that a survey is automatically wrong, but it can be if they have done it in the wrong way. Sure. It, it's the case with a lot of these flaws where it's like, it's not that conditional reasoning was bad, but a mistaken reversal was. Each one of these elements that are out there, you have to look at it and say to yourself, did they do it the right way or not? And it's when it's the wrong way that it ends up being the right answer to these problems. Yeah, and chances are they've done it the wrong way because that's a more interesting construct, frankly. There's more flaws than good arguments on this test. Yeah, putting good arguments out there into the world, on the L side at least, really serves little purpose. There's not much you can do with a good argument. You can't weaken it. You can't strengthen it. You know, so you can't talk about a flaw. So the fact that most of the arguments you encounter on this test have issues, have errors, and that these tend to represent some of the more common ones, you got to know these. Agreed. All right. I think that brings us to the end of the discussion for the day. Any final comments, John? No, no. Like I said, I'm, I love, love these flaw conversations. I could do this for like (laughs) six more hours. Honestly. It's more topical, that's for sure. Yeah. But we still haven't talked about Britney Spears, so she's going to have to come up sometime soon. Oh, the great, she's full of flaws. The greatest flaw of the 2000s. <laughs> I, heard, I heard an instructor say the other day that 2007 gave us two amazing things. Comparative reading and Britney Spears attacking a van with an umbrella. I know. It's forgettable. <laughs> that is magnificent. <laughs> On both accounts. <laughs> All right. Our next episode, barring some crazy unforeseen <laughs> thing occurring, will probably be an extension of this and we'll get into some uh, part to whole flaws. We'll get into things like false dilemma and what have you. Sure. But in the meantime, if you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube, or anywhere else you find us. Give us a rating, and please send any questions you might have. We'll have a mailbag coming up pretty soon. You can send those to lsatpodcast at powerscore.com or lsat at powerscore.com. Thanks so much for listening, and everybody have a great week.